Hello, I'm Dave Stanley. This is the first brief in the series to challenge the thinking. And this one's titled Energy and Climate Change, the Global Drivers. And in it, we'll take a look at how and where you and your organisation contribute to climate change. We'll then take an overview on energy, how and where we use it, how efficient we are with it, and where the big opportunities lie. With concern over rising oil prices, climate change, it's very easy for us to overlook the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are this, that we're actually dependent upon the sun and solar energy for the functioning of the planet, and the sun's also responsible for most of the energy that we use. And it's through this amazing process of photosynthesis, where with the chlorophyll in the leaf here, nature turns around and captures carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, turns it into carbohydrates, which we can then use as food and energy. In doing so, it actually takes a couple of percent of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere during the summer. Unfortunately, it re-releases it again during the winter. But in doing so, it's a reminder to us of where part of the solution to the problems that we face lie. Right, well, let's start then with climate change. We'll take a look at that and then thereafter we'll largely park the topic. Let's start with global warming. Usually it's um, compared with what's called the greenhouse effect. If you consider a simple greenhouse, you have shortwave solar radiation penetrates the glass, it is reflected by the soil or uh, paths in the greenhouse and the plants, and then long wave radiation is given off and that is trapped by the greenhouse and raises the temperature. The greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere have a similar effect and they raise the temperature of the Earth's surface by some 30 degrees centigrade, giving us a global average of around about 15 degrees centigrade, which makes the world a very acceptable place to live in as we know it. There is a bit of a problem, as you've gathered. Carbon dioxide levels are rising you go back some 60,000 years or so, you'll see that the carbon dioxide levels were around about 220 parts per million. And then around about uh, 15,000 years ago, there was a significant rise up to about 270 parts per million. Sea level rose, UK got separated from the continent. And since about 10,000 years ago, there's been a fairly steady um, but slow rise in uh, carbon dioxide to about 280 parts per million and then since the Industrial Revolution it's taken off and we're now up around about 390 parts per million and the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are continuing to rise rapidly. If you take a look at this bar chart this is the CO2 emissions between 2000 and 2005 and basically they rose around about 12% globally over that period. What is of note though is one has to bear in mind that it's anticipated the uh, population of the planet will go up from about 6.7 billion to 9 billion people and the demand for energy, consequential greenhouse gases will increase. This is particularly obvious if you take a look at the transport here. The yellow bit is the current consumption uh, or emissions of greenhouse gases by the United States and the blue there is China and you can imagine what's going to happen when the Chinese, their 1.3 population, end up with uh, a car ownership rate comparable with that of the United States. There's going to be a very significant increase uh, in um, greenhouse gas emissions there and a similar story is to be told on the uh, building side. Fundamental to understanding what's happening with uh, climate change, global warming, is to appreciate where the carbon lies. So if we look at the global carbon cycle, you can see that the atmosphere has around about 760 gigatons of carbon. That's carbon, not carbon dioxide. There's about 600 gigatons of carbon locked up in uh, vegetation, the biomass, the forest and so on. And there's 16,000 correction, 1,600 gigatons of carbon in the soil. In other words, the soil contains more carbon 
then it's contained in the vegetation and atmosphere together. There's also about a thousand gigatons of um, carbon in the surface uh, layers of the oceans. There's also 4,000 gigatons or thereabouts of fossil fuels there that could be extracted but are unlikely to be and quite obviously those 4,000 tons there will not go into the atmosphere where there's only 800 tons at the moment without very serious consequences. This is called the carbon cycle. The reason for this is that there are huge exchange, exchanges of carbon between the vegetation and the atmosphere. So on land, you can see it's of the order of about 60 gigatons per year is exchanged. There's a similar situation uh, happening over the oceans there where 90 gigatons is transferred to the atmosphere and back again. This cycling of the carbon in the past has meant that the atmosphere has basically been stable. However, changes are taking place. On the land we have ecosystem loss and degradation, primarily down to the demand for food. Also over the oceans, similar ecosystem loss and degradation arising from acidification uh, of the oceans themselves, pollution and uh, fishing. In addition to that, we have these significant emissions there, around about six gigatons of uh, greenhouse gases, largely carbon dioxide uh, and driven by the use of fossil fuels. Of that six gigatons that goes into the atmosphere, some two to two and a half gigatons ends up being absorbed by the ocean, part of that acidification process I mentioned. And about three gigatons accumulates in the atmosphere giving us that rise in CO2 that we've already mentioned. As a result of this rise in CO2 in the atmosphere and the changes in the ecosystems here, the atmosphere is going unstable, weather climate is becoming unpredictable, hence this is referred to as climate change. We've just had a look at the global carbon cycle. So how does carbon relate to carbon dioxide? Well basically one atom of carbon burns to one molecule of carbon dioxide. Carbon, atomic weight 12, combines with two atoms of oxygen, each 16, total 32, to give you a molecular weight for the carbon dioxide of 44. And in this process, it releases energy. So, in total then, one tonne of carbon will burn to three and a half tonnes, or thereabouts, of carbon dioxide. That's the equivalent of about... Uh, 500 cubic meters. Now, when considering targets or looking at data, it's important to ensure that you're comparing like with like. Are the units carbon or are they carbon dioxide? And you modify accordingly. Then, of course, we have this chat on the low carbon economy. Well, as we've just seen, there's carbon absolutely everywhere. But typically, what is meant by the expression is it's a lower greenhouse gas emission economy and there we're largely talking about the emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. So what are these greenhouse gases and where do they come from? Well by far the largest is carbon dioxide responsible for about 85 percent of UK's greenhouse gas emissions, overall increase in the atmosphere of the order of about 40 percent and carbon dioxide is reckoned to have a global warming potential of one and it's against this that the other gases are rated. There are three primary sources of CO2 emissions. The obvious one is fossil fuels and the sources there are oil and gas, coal and shale oil and shale gas. These fuels, fossil fuels, are then used for electricity generation and transport, heating and cooling of buildings, fertiliser production, food production, clothing, manufacturing, construction, cement, plastics. Basically, it underpins the economic system as we know it. The second source of uh, carbon dioxide emissions is the burning of the biomass or vegetation. The source of that then, forest fires, burning of the Amazon and uh, tropical uh, jungles in uh, Indonesia, used for clearance for ranching, conversion to arable 
and also particularly in the uh, far east there uh, for the production of uh, palm oil. We also get um, emissions from peat fires usually as an accidental consequence of forest fires in the far east there where the underlying soil there is predominantly peat that catches fire. It can also happen on moorlands where it's being cleared for the gorse and the heather uh, regrowth and again the peat there can uh, burn. It also arises out of the incineration of organic waste. Two drivers on this. One is the reduction of landfill. So in uh, reducing what goes to landfill, we turn around and burn it. But also specifically for um, biofuels, uh, co-burning, where we burn organic waste, straw and uh, coppice in our power stations. The fourth is biofuels. Transport, use of bioethanol and power generation, as I mentioned, co-fired uh, with straw there. And also heating and cooking, particularly in the developing world, where they will use wood, peat and uh, animal dung. The third source of carbon dioxide, one which is frequently forgotten, is the releases from soil. This arises from the removal of uh, woodland and forest. Again, land clearance primarily for arable purposes, but also for um, timber production and uh, paper pulp. The conversion of grassland to arable, the ploughing up of uh, grassland there, either as a result of moving away from a mixed farming system to a completely arable one, or the intensification of an arable system uh, which results in monoculture and again no carbon is being or very little carbon is re being returned to the land, you get emissions from that. And the final one is from the draining of fenland and peatland, where the dry peat, almost 100% carbon, then oxidises and comes off as carbon dioxide. And that again happens for uh, crops in, for instance, the fens around uh, the wash, and on the uplands there it's for uh, conversion to um, woodland for timber purposes. This land use change that we've just been dis discussing though can be reversed and result in carbon recovery. So what happens is there that the carbon can be taken out of the atmosphere through the photosynthesis that we've already uh, mentioned and put back into the vegetation and through uh, the root systems and also through grassland it can be put back into the soil. This reversal process then requires the uh, planting of trees either on grassland or arable land and turning it back into woodland or it's from the conversion of arable back into grassland or into a mixed farming system and also by the ceasing of the draining of fens and the peatland there the uh, peat the uh, gorse and the heather then can regenerate and start putting the peat back in this process is finite. It cannot go on any definitely and largely brings us back to the sort of stable state that, that we were about 100 or so years ago in terms of the amount of carbon that was in the soil and possibly the woodlands as well. But it's worth making the point that it results in economic and ecosystem benefits. The second gas is methane. Uh, responsible for around about 8% of uh, UK greenhouse gas emissions, a whopping 156% increase globally. Methane is reckoned to be about 20 or so times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas and it arises from the rotting process of organic matter, uh, in other words anaerobically in the absence of oxygen. Number of sources for this, organic waste, paper, card, food, wood and clothing going to uh, landfill where it's capped and no oxygen gets in, get methane emissions from that. Also from cattle, the enteric fermentation of uh, grass and fodder in the uh, gut of uh, cattle, absence of oxygen and again you get to them belching a significant amount of methane and it also can come from the slurry in the manure from dairy and uh, beef farms and other livestock farms for that matter as well. 
You also get methane from rice paddies, rotting vegetation below the water and that results in uh, methane emissions. And finally, not part of the natural processes there, but you get releases of methane from coal mines and oil wells or leakages in our gas mains. Third gas, nitrous oxide. Very powerful gas, but 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Small percent, five, responsible for about 5% of our emissions in the UK. Globally, it's gone up about 18%. Primary source of this is the use of nitrogen fertilisers, chemical fertilisers. You do also get uh, emissions of nitrous oxide from legumes, in other words clovers, beans and uh, so on. And nitrogen fertilisers is obviously used to boost the yields of uh, food and production and also of uh, biofuels. Another significant rising source is in road transport. In our desire to turn around and clean up uh, the pollution in our urban areas, we've uh, fitted catalytic converters and these catalytic re uh, converters uh, change NOx emissions into nitrous oxide emissions. So the global warming potential of transport has increased as a consequence of that. Another source is uh, sewage works, again the removal of the solids, uh, organic matter and so on, nitrous oxide emissions uh, take place there. There's another group of gases, the CFCs, HCFCs and so on. Small percentage, around about two. These gases are or were foreign in the atmosphere, completely man-made. Potentially some very powerful gases there, from about 150 to about 12,000 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. What are they used for? Refrigeration, freezing, so both in domestic, uh, retail, store and transport used primarily for um, the cooling of food, drink and um, medical. Another source is the air conditioning systems in buildings uh, and also in your cars there. And heat pumps, the reverse of the uh, refrigeration process, so used for space heating in uh, buildings. There's a few other gases, quite small but very powerful ones, PFCs, and uh, sulfur hexafluoride, uh, which are largely associated with uh, industrial processes, and there's also ozone. However, a very significant gas, which is not included under Kyoto, is water vapour. Water vapour arises obviously from the heating of um, water, both the seas, the rivers, the um, uh, and uh, lakes and so on, and also you get transpiration from uh, vegetation. Water vapours are found in clouds and generally throughout the whole atmosphere. This process is extremely complex, but nevertheless water vapour is a greenhouse gas. Where this becomes significant is with aviation. Basically, air, the majority of the aircraft that we use fly above the tropopause. They're in the stratosphere where there is very little exchange of uh, gases between the troposphere and the stratosphere. And in burning of fossil fuels, aircraft are not only putting out CO2, they're also putting out a huge amount of water. Typically see it in the form of contrading, but this dumping of water vapour into the upper atmosphere has a very significant uh, uh, global warming effect. And it's generally reckoned to be about three times greater than the straightforward CO2 emissions that you get from uh, aviation itself. So in the UK, whilst aviation is only responsible for about 6% of the fossil fuel consumption, multiply it by three, and aviation is around about 18% of the global warming effect of the UK's um, uh, economy. Hence the reason, one of the simplest in debt uh, easiest things that one can do to reduce one's global warming impact there is to uh, minimise uh, use of uh, aviation. So, what are the global warming impacts? Well, the IPC, that's the International Panel for Climate Change, summarises them as follows. Human development is resulting in various tipping points. Reduced agricultural pr productivity, 
heightened water insecurity, increased exposure to extreme weather events, collapse of the ecosystems and increased health risks. You can see this lot here are one hell of a health risk. In terms of accounting for your greenhouse gas emissions and footprinting them, or even trading them for the larger organisations, the greenhouse gas emissions are broken down into three categories, or scopes if you like, scope one, two and three. Scope one and two are compulsory for reporting purposes, and that includes the emissions associated with your own transport and the fossil fuels that are consumed on site. Scope two is the fossil fuels that went into the electricity that uh, uh, you consumed. And scope three, which is discretionary, but also the most challenging and probably the greatest, includes just about everything else. Uh, employee travel to and from work, the energy and fossil fuel and emissions associated with the purchase of your materials, the extraction processes, and also the life cycle costs of the consumption of goods and so on and so forth. You can see there's plenty of time for uh, consultants there in terms of calculating all those emissions. Here's a simpler take on it for you. These are the UK greenhouse gas emissions between 1990 and 2008. This large chunk here is down to energy. That's industrial processes, that's agriculture, and the top bit, the green, is down to waste. From this, you can see fundamentally, if you focus at the front end of your organisation and go for energy reduction, then you not only reduce your greenhouse gases, you also reduce your consumption of a significant cost, i.e. the cost of energy. So you uh, increase your competitiveness at the same time. If you're still undecided on climate change as a sort of moral issue, you might uh, like to tap in Wandering Mind 42 after this and uh, see what you make of that. It's about uh, five minutes worth and uh, it's quite interesting. That's enough on climate change. Let's take a look, look at energy, its use, abuse and consumer demand. Let's take two situations. One where the investment exceeds return, and by that I mean if you look at a hunter-gatherer who expends a certain amount of calories by way of energy in getting the food to the day, for the day, and the amount of food that's gathered in by way of calories is less than that that was expended, then clearly the individual is going to starve. On the other hand, if that individual gathers in more energy, more calories than was expended, then there's a benefit that can be taken either by way of a song, a dance, progressively you can start paying for academia and the civil service and so on. What fossil fuels has done for us, it's given that a huge increase on our investment. But what's happening with fossil fuels in terms of the yield or the return on the input? Historically, oil was one unit of energy in for a hundred units of energy back. Take the Beano Dandy or whatever. Comic strip there. Something knocks a spike in the ground. Out spurts the oil can underneath. Very high return on the investment. Nowadays with the increased difficulty of our drilling operations, North Sea, Poland, so on and so forth there, the return on oil is down to 1 to 30 and is dropping. With shale oil, we're told we have a huge amount of uh, shale oil uh, available globally, but because of the steam that goes into extracting it, and also a very complex energy intensive um, refining process, the return on shale is 1 to 3 to 5. Bioethanol, the renewable fuel, there it's 1 in for 1.2 back because of the nitrate fertilizers, farm machinery and a very energy intensive uh, refining process. With food, if you remember from the quiz, 10 in, 1 out, or 1 unit in, 0.1 out. So the basic message here is that the usable energy from the remaining reserves is declining. Then there's this issue of peak oil, which you may have heard about. Situation is that the current rate of oil exploration and discovery 
is not keeping up with our current rate of consumption. So it's anticipated that over the next few years, the available oil is going to go into decline, and with it, of course, there will presumably be a price hike. This is the BP Statistical Review of World Energy in 2010. And from this, you can see that between 2005 and 2008, oil production globally has plateaued. It declined in 2009 because of the economic recession. Another factor, of course, with the increased difficulty of uh, extracting the oil is the huge environmental risks that go with it. Graphs like this one are used to show the efficiency of the UK economy either by way of the uh, energy or by way of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. And on it, it indicates output measured by GDP has increased from about 100 to 160 over this 18-year uh, period. And the efficiency of the economy has increased because the energy used per unit output has decreased. Similar sort of story on the greenhouse gas side. If, however, we take a look at uh, UK primary energy consumption, in this instance it's fossil fuels, it tells a somewhat different story. So in terms of the total fossil fuels that have gone into the UK economy between 1990 and 2005, it's increased by 10%. And in most economic areas, there has generally been an increase in the energy required to operate that economic activity. Most notable on this is transport and communications, where the energy uh, consumption there has increased by about 60%. There are two exceptions. One is manufacturing, which has dropped about 10%, largely because we've exported our energy intensive um, uh, industries, shipbuilding, steel and so on. There's also agriculture, which has dropped by 10% as well, and unsurprisingly, agricultural productivity in the UK has dropped 10% over that period. In addition to that, you can add another 40% or thereabouts to the, that uh, total figure in the bottom right hand corner there to account for the energy that's embodied into our imports that we get from China, Brazil and uh, India. Fundamental message here then, UK energy consumption is increasing. So what about energy efficiency, the way in which we use this? Well, this shows you what happens with our electricity generation. A significant or the, the largest um, part of our energy uh, electricity is still generated by coal and those power stations are only 36% efficient. The more modern gas ones are significantly better, they're up around about 53%. Electricity goes into the system there, and then we experience losses of about 8% transmission through the grid and stuffing it back down into the factories and in, into our homes. However, the total energy that's actually arrived at the consumer, which would be 36% of that, is then used for heat. What is of interest, though, is this massive amount of waste heat here, which is normally dispersed into the atmosphere or into uh, rivers and the sea. And therein lies some significant opportunities for increased efficiency through combined heat and power, whereby we utilise that heat for uh, greenhouses, for heating buildings and so on. What's happening on the domestic front? Well. Despite all the insulation that's gone into houses, you can see overall energy consumption at the domestic level has increased, a slight decrease over the last uh, couple of years there. But fundamentally, over this, the last 30, 40 years there, it has gone up. So despite all the expenditure that has been on insulating our homes, our consumption of energy for heating purposes has increased. And the reason for that is that rather than taking it for an e as an energy saving, we've actually taken it as a heat gain. So the temperature in the average home has gone from around about plus 13 to plus 18 degrees over that period. Message? Domestically increasing demand for energy. What about on the transport front? Well, cars over the last 10 years 
there's been no improvement in MPG. 32 in 1997 and in 2006 it was still 32 miles to the gallon. What about our transport fleet? Well, rigid trucks over the 10 year period have gone from 10.3 miles to the gallon down to 9.1 and Arctics have gone from 8 down to 7.7 .7 miles per gallon. There's a number of reasons for this. Congestion might be one. There has been an increase in the all-up weight of um, uh, trucks there. They've got articulated trucks. They've gone from 40 to 44. But also there's been uh, more pollution prevention devices, catalytic inverters fitted to trucks, which will also decrease their um, efficiency. What about energy security? We've all benefited from what was in the North Sea. Unfortunately, we're now net importers of energy and have been for the last uh, four years or so. So we're now dependent upon energy supplies, both gas and oil, from other countries. Some comes from Norway, but also some uh, of the gas, as you're aware, comes from Russia. We're also importing it from uh, the Middle East and um, West Africa. Who has the oil? Well, this slide here shows the country size according to the amount of oil reserves that they're holding. So if you take the United States, it has few reserves. The UK is up there, hasn't got a lot. You can see the massive amount of oil that there is in the Middle East. Let's summarise then on these global energy drivers. First of all, there's climate change. There's a moral issue there, there's an environmental issue, but there's also an economic issue in terms of rising carbon taxes. There's increasing population and with it an increased global demand, India, China, Brazil. We've got increasing UK consumption. The yield in terms of our return on the available reserves is declining. We've got peak oil. Global oil reserves will go into decline. We've got very low efficiency in terms of electricity generation and also our transport systems. And we've got increasing dependency on imports for our energy. And with it, of course, there is a security of supply issue there. So what's the conclusion? It's basically this. Future demand of oil will exceed supply. The days of cheap oil are over. So what's a smart solution to it? If we reduce the demand and our consumption of energy, then we also reduce our greenhouse gases and also we improve our competitiveness, particularly at the organisational level. Now, is this obvious? Well, if you look at DEF and DEFRA policy documents, you will find that in there, they will turn around on energy and say, yes, all sorts of measures to support energy efficiency, energy savings, carbon reduction, greenhouse gas reduction. Energy efficiency is not the same as energy reduction. There is a thing called Gevron's Paradox, an economist uh, in the 1880s, who observed that with the increasing efficiency of railways, the actual consumption of energy actually increased. What you will not find in DEC and DEFRA policy documents, or if there is, it's only a glancing mention of it and then it's never developed, is references to energy reduction and demand management and demand reduction. How does energy and climate change relate to sustainability? Well, look at it this way. The planet is supported by a wide range of ecosystems. From those ecosystems in the Earth's crust, we extract energy, which is then used to extract and process resources that supports the economy, transport, power generation, food, government, defence, retail, clothing, and consumption, and so on. As a result of that, we then have negative environmental impacts, carbon and nitrogen cycle disruption, ecosystem and biodiversity loss, soil degradation, water and air pollution, acidification, health, hunger issues, 
ozone depletion and of course climate change. But note, climate change is just one of a wide range of challenges, negative impacts that we face. Also, all these negative impacts there actually come back to bite us in our ecosystems and result in degradation and loss of those ecosystems which then threatens the health and viability of the planet as a whole. So, what is the challenge to the thinking? Simply here, look. targeting carbon reduction is to address only one environmental impact. It incurs additional costs and ignores the huge additional impacts arise from the use to which that energy is put, as indicated in those impacts there. Energy reduction, on the other hand, delivers a reduction in most of the global environmental impacts, increased energy security, competitive advantage, and it gives you the greenhouse gas reductions and climate change mitigations. Now for the good news. Would you believe 80% of the UK's energy is consumed by transport and buildings? 30% or so on transport, 50% on buildings. And the next couple of briefs, what we will do is look at how we can achieve a 50% reduction in energy consumption in both transport and buildings. Not by 2030, but by tomorrow, by taking some very obvious actions that actually all add up to hopefully something in the region of that 50% I'm indicating to you there. Hope to see you on the next few briefs.